But I got back again when, when I when I was dean of the Cooney Institute. I made it a point of visit him and giving my business card, so that he knew that I had survived his firing. Uh, the only other thing that I want to tell you before I joined the army was uh, that I became night auditor in a little hotel on the west side called the Franklin Towers. And the only reason that it was of any interest is because, <coughs> because I learned how to operate one of those switchboards, you know, the kind that you plug things in. I didn't really know how to do it, and one of the fellows said, well, you're going to be night auditor. Whenever you, you see a light, you put it in and talk to them. But watch this one, because that's the, man, that's the owner or the manager, when that down you. So I sat there and I was watching that light, and all the lights went up and behind me said, what the hell are you doing? I was a manager. <laughs> and, uh, but he taught me how to do it, and it was helpful. Because when I got to Camp Ritchie, and I'm switching to that almost right away, when I got to Camp Ritchie, I was, well, first they didn't have enough room. You saw the tents, they hadn't built all the barracks yet. And they were going to give us three day passes, and Sergeant Oates didn't know what to do. He had to have a three, more, three more days to, to finish the barracks. So he was going to give passes to those who deserved it. So we were all in line. I'd only been in the Army for about four weeks. I'd been to basic training in Fort McClellan, Alabama. And they pulled me out of there in, in March and sent me to Camp Ritchie, just like we saw in the movie there. And uh, so when it came, uh, and I knew we were all going to do KP, kitchen police, and meaning peeling potatoes. And uh, I was facing that. I had told my parents in New York I wasn't going to see them for about six months or so. I went again to Sergeant Otis and said, when was the last time you had a pass, soldier? I said, I haven't had a pass since I've been in the Army. He said, here it is. <laughs> and I got three days past, I went to New York, say, hi, parents, I'm back. That was, but then on the way out, I got passed by the single co office, and I saw one of those switchboards. I looked in, you know, curious as it was, and the lieutenant says, you know how to operate? I mean, I said, yeah, I used to work at the Franklin house. Yeah, but I can't because I got to do KP when I get back. He said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And I didn't have to do KP. I <laughs> <laughs> Life can be beautiful, you know. <laughs> Let's see what else I want to tell you. Oh yeah, well then, then oh yeah, then, then I became a citizen in May. That's just a few months after I joined the service, and uh, and I was trained as a military intelligence interrogator. And I have I brought with me some handouts as to how we how we uh, interrogated people. Now I won't take the time to read it, but I've got some handouts uh, as to how we did it. But at the time. I looked like this, and I want to know if you can find out who I am. Just pass it around. Mm -hmm. If you can listen while you're looking, see if you can, you know. The police guy. You're not supposed to say those things. <laughs> God, the way. Don't pay attention to him. I'm in there. <laughs> anyway, uh, I learned how to be a military intelligence, uh, IPW, an interrogator, prisoner of war, and it was, it was really quite interesting. And I want, to, I want to give you an idea as to the kind of things we had to we had to learn. So excuse me for just a second while I, I have it in here. You know, we had to learn Morse code. In fact, I wrote a letter in Morse code to my sister in New York, and knowing that the census were going to read it, and I said to my sister, I, I, don't worry about the census, let them figure this thing out, but I haven't said anything important yet. But I did it in Morse code. I just wanted to show off to my sister. <laughs> but uh, but you see, the kind of thing that I learned, just to give you an idea, German army organization, that's a basic course, learning all about the German army. We had to learn it about the Italian army, the order of battle. Uh, the order of battle was a very important thing because later on I was sent to a very special secret unit uh, which was located at a place called Fort Hunt, which is a civil war camp, but because it was so secret they called it P.O. Box 1142. And in that, in that particular uh, place, we had to write a, a, a book called the Order of Battle Book. And, uh, I will show you later some typical pages. You know, every one of us was assigned a chapter, and we had to write a chapter giving information about the German army so that our American officers, when they got to Normandy, 
They would know everything about the units they were facing, about the soldiers they were facing, the commanders they had. And they actually made a painting of us, which is going to be hanging in a visitor center at, at the old Fort Hunt. And I have, I actually ultimately got a photograph of the painting and it's hanging in my home in my office. So if you want to see the painting, you can visit me, but this is pretty good shot. It shows you the, uh, it shows you the bags of material that are coming in at all of us doing this study. But I'm a little bit ahead of, ahead of myself, so let me, no, not yet, sorry, I screwed up here. No, I want to be chronologically so you can follow me. We learned the uh, Auto Battle, which is what I just told you, and I'll tell you more about it. We learned Morse Code, Terrain and Aerial Intelligence, Document Reading, Field Exercises, Close Combat, Testing of Skills, and the final examination, let me read you this to show you what we had to know at the end of our training. Towards the end of the training program, all trainees, both officers and enlisted men, were sent on a 48-hour exercise and then a week-long exercise outside of the camp. Each station of the exercise tested a different skill, for example, intercepting telephone conversation, interrogating prisoners. Instructors were placed at each station and graded on their performance. During the final examination, each trainee was given a clipboard with numbers 1 to 50 pre-printed. He was then ordered to make the round of a huge meadow where uniform pieces, weapons, etc. were placed, labeled with the corresponding numbers, and then were expected to identify each item of equipment. I hope that gives you a rough idea of what, you, what they were trained at Camp Ritchie. And it was, I loved it. I, I just thought life couldn't be any better. It was exciting. I lived in Morse and I was doing all these things. I mean, we, were, we were treated well, you know, food was pretty good. I, we always complain about the army food, but looking back, it wasn't so bad, it wasn't well. I hope you were in the right place at the right time. You're damn right, that made the difference. You had a few rations while I was at Camp Ritchie. Well, that's your tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, so, after, after I finished, I was in one of the early classes. Most of the men that you saw in the movie came in classes 10, 12, 14. Each class was about six weeks or four or six weeks. I was in the early class, and so then they decided to send me to auto battle school. And auto battle was, as I explained, it's a, it's a way of learning all about the American, uh, all about the German army. The generals, the table of organization, the weapons, everything. And my, and then I was sent to a place that I had just started to talk about. It was called MIRS, the Military Intelligence Research Section of the War Department General Staff, G2. That's a long word, but it was a very small group of 18 enlisted men and three officers, one British and two Americans. Of all of us, there are only two of us left now, myself and my buddy in, who lives in, in uh, at least in Germany now because he's a, he's a musician. He conducted an orchestra in Chicago for most many of his years. And he met a German woman. He lives in Dresden because they can see an opera or a concert every night for almost nothing. And compared to America, where you have to pay, uh, I don't know what you pay for a metropolitan opera, but more than in Dresden, I promise you. <laughs> so that's why he's living in Dresden. But anyway, uh, the, the third one that was still alive while the uh, you know, when they heard about our unit, the, uh, the National Park Service was working on this, on this special museum, and they didn't know that we even existed until somebody gave our names, and they flew down to my home, and they videographed me, and uh, the whole business, you know, because they, they wanted to know all about it, and then they contacted my friend in, in Dresden, and they even contacted my former boss, who's in this painting here. Uh, his name was Lieutenant John W. Kruger. He was a nice guy, not very bright. His English, his general wasn't very good. But he was innocent, except I found out in 1996 he was one of the richest men in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He owned lots of radio stations and everything. And he wouldn't talk to the National Park Service. So I said, let me try. So I wrote him a letter. And I got a call from his son saying your letter to my dad, who was at the time 88 or so, uh, 90 maybe, uh, I got the letter, I'll tell you what, if you will help me 
with my father's biography, I will get you in touch with Dad. I said, yeah, it's a deal. So he got me, and, and I, John talked to me. I said, you remember me, you know? I remember you weren't a bad officer. You weren't all that good in German, but it was okay. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I remember you, Paul. He said, where do you live? I said, I live in Stockton. He said, oh, I used to own a radio station there once. So he was, he was sharp enough for that. And they, they flew down to Florida, and they interviewed him, and I had a record of an interview. And he's passed away since then. But it's kind of no, nice to have known the second richest man in the United States. <laughs> anyway, here's a painting that will give you an idea of what the painting looks like, and I have a good picture of it in my house. So I'll go on. It was a very exciting time in, uh, just a minute. Oh yes, uh, when I was at, at MIRS, we were awfully close to the <coughs> Pentagon, and we did a lot of work for the officers in, in military intelligence, because we were speaking German, and, the, and the, the documents came in from North Africa, as you remember, the, in the fall of 1942, we invaded North Africa, and we started getting documents, and our job was to analyze them, not just to translate them, but to analyze them and to make sense out of them so that, so that we could publish this book in time for the invasion. And uh, as soon as the Normandy invasion came on the 6th of June, we got word that they wanted us in London because there were so many documents coming into the war office, they didn't have enough people to, to do what we were doing. So they, uh, a couple of weeks later they flew us over to London, and I remember we were put up at the Strand Hotel, which is not a senior hotel, not a senior hotel, but not a first class either. And all I remember is my buddy and I had a room, and we, if the pin was in the door on the outside, the other one couldn't get in, and that was a good system. <laughs> but I, <laughs> <laughs> you want the truth? I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> 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 Oh, anyway, after a few weeks in Germany, after, did that already make or did you figure out who I was? to come to this side of the room. Oh, didn't come? No. Did sorry. you figure out who I was in that picture? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wait, well, you're you're the tall, tall, guy. tall guy. The most handsome. And tall. Uh, the only tall I have room. a lot of faults, but family is not one of them, so don't know. No. <laughs> Who's the person named Snow White? With it? The name's the lot? What does Snow White? Snow White? From the picture. On, on that one? Look at the bottom right, bottom uh, on the, where the names are. Mm -hmm. I have to look at it before I can tell you, sir. I'll look at it later. <laughs> um, anyway, after a few weeks after we got to London, the officers in the Pentagon said, hey, we can't do it without those. We don't speak German. So they called us back to, the, to 1142 to finish the war there because they, they just needed it. And the only interesting story I have to tell you is, on the 6th of June, the day of the invasion, we brilliant American military intelligence people decided that the intelligence department at the Pentagon was going to move because they would figure there's no way that we would invade Germany or uh, Europe when our intelligence moves. So that's the day military intelligence moved from one corner to another at the Pentagon. And what Deeth and I did, honest to God, it sounds impossible, it's true. We needed a couple of desks, and we were only 14, 10, 14 miles uh, from the Pentagon. It's between Alexandria and Mount Vernon, you see, Portland. So we took a pickup, a, 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 a one and a half ton truck, and a couple of men, and we all had passes, obviously. We drove into the Pentagon, we went to the, where the military intelligence department was, there were a couple of desks sitting out in the corner. We loaded them on our truck and took them back to the I think that was really quite a move, you know. But that's, uh, sometimes I think intelligence has improved from then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Are we already at 3 o'clock? Yeah, I'm a little late. Okay. 20 more minutes. Okay. Well, I was going to have a 10 minute break, but should I just continue? And if you need to go, go by yourself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
After the war, we were sent to Camp Ritchie, Maryland, and they started at, in Camp Ritchie, Maryland, by this time, was called GMDS, the German Military Document Section. And that, the only way I can I explain it, it was like the Library of Congress for Military Documents. It was our job to, uh, uh, to analyze and to take the documents and to, and to uh, categorize them. And I think I'll, I'll pass a couple of these pictures around. You can just pass them around so people can see what it looks like. And that's what we did till the end of the war. There were some German soldiers that we worked with. In fact, one of them was very nice. My father wrote this book, How to Become a Stamp Dealer. And one of the German prisoners, with whom I became friendly, was a commercial artist. And for a